keynote speaker. Um, he's a renowned speaker and geopolitical analyst. Um, he's a guest of ours and a good friend of the New York chapter of Sign Up. Please welcome Caleb Melvin. The political circus of 2020 has already started. The 2020 election. What a, what a fun, fun couple couple months, couple years it's going to be. So we got Beto, Beto O'Rourke, right, he's, right. he's running, he's coming out there. I am like so cool guys, like I can stand on top of things and give speeches and, and I used to be in a hacker group when I was a teenager. I am like so cool, it's so awesome. Wow, I'm Beto O'Rourke. Uh, you got Joe Biden, he's like, yeah, the rules have changed, you know, it used to be okay to touch people inappropriately, I guess it's not anymore, oh, I made a mistake, sorry, not a big deal though, I didn't really do anything. And then you got Bernie Sanders, he's like, last time they stole the election from me, this time I am going to run, and hopefully they will not do the same thing again. <laughs> it's a circus, but I'm not here to talk about that, I'm actually here to talk about real politics ideology. I'm here to represent the left. And, you know, the origins of the terms left and right, they go back to the French Revolution. At the time, you know, the, the feudal king was toppled, and the people of France set up the National Assembly. And those who were still loyal to the old system and the old order, they sat on the right. But those who wanted to march into the future and march towards something more progressive and exciting, they sat on the left. And there's actually a document where some noble was observing the National Assembly. And he said, you know, those of us who still love the king, we sat on the right, but it was the innovators, the innovators who sat on the left. Well, I very much consider myself to be an innovator. I hope everyone here considers themselves to be an innovator. And in times like these, we desperately need innovation more than ever before. I would say that the first leftist probably existed maybe five, six, seven, or eight thousand years ago. At that time, human beings were hunter-gatherers. They were hunting and gathering. They were hunting animals. They were gathering fruits and nuts and vegetation in order to live. And there was somebody, could have been a woman, could have been a man, we don't know who it was. And they had the brilliant idea to start sharpening sticks and instead of just trying to grab animals with their bare hands, make tools to, to, to hunt with. And there was probably somebody else after that, I mean the second leftist, you could say, who had the brilliant idea that maybe we ought, to, we ought to pay attention to the patterns and how these plants are growing so that we can hunt and gather more effectively, right? And it was human beings with our creativity and our brilliance, we got to be so good at hunting and gathering that there was a scarcity. And so then, we had our first social revolution. We had the origin of private property. We had the domestication of animals. We had the growing of crops. History marched forward in response to a shortage created by human be beings becoming brilliant and creative. You want to talk about who leftists are, right? The term left and right goes back to the French Revolution. But I think if you look at human history, Leftism as a concept has been around a lot longer than that. I think that the leftists, you could basically say the leftists were the city builders. If you look at ancient times, you had these vibrant civilizations that, that started to spring up all across the world. Timbuktu in Africa, Carthage in what is now Tunisia, Rome, you know, Athens, Greece. It's interesting, in Mesopotamia, you had the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is in terms of human literature, human mythology, it's considered to be very, very important. One of the most important moments in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the myth of Mesopotamia, is when Gilgamesh would fight a, a bull. He fights against a bull, the bull of heaven. And Gilgamesh, the hero, the founder of Mesopotamia, he fights against this bull. And in doing so, he's basically telling human beings there don't have to be animals. This bull is bigger than Gilgamesh. This bull is huge. It's the bull of heaven. But he, as a human being, can defeat the bull because he possesses intelligence, because he possesses creativity. He possesses what separates human beings from animals. And it's odd because nowadays we know about some, some parts of the world they have bullfighting, the ritual of bullfighting. And that's considered to be a pretty awful thing. It's cruelty to animals, it's pretty, pretty horrific. But it, it, it's a, it's a reenactment of that epic of Gilgamesh, uh, of, of celebrating that human being separating themselves from animals. You know, you could talk about Confucius 
and the, the great achievements of, of Chinese civilization. And one of the best books that I have ever read was Michael Parenti's book, uh, uh, Julius Caesar's Assassination, The People's History of Ancient Rome. It's a great book. And if you read it, Michael Parenti talks about how we've got history all wrong. This idea that Julius Caesar was just this brutal dictator and, and that the senators killed him to save democracy is a lie. Julius Caesar was a fighter for the people, for the working class, the proletarians of Rome. And he was trying very much in the middle of what was really a historical abomination, the Roman Empire. I mean, it was an empire that went around the world plundering people and beating people down and holding back historical progress. You had Julius Caesar rallying the proletarians and expanding literacy and building libraries and trying to have land redistribution, and trying to build something progressive within this, this abomination, this disgusting reactionary force, the Roman Empire. Leftists have been around for a long time. We talk about the Dark Ages in Europe. And in the Dark Ages, medieval times, human beings were basically considered to be the property of other people. It was believed that humans existed simply to serve those who were above them. Serfs served the landowners, uh, commoners served the king, and that people existed simply to glorify what they called their natural superiors, right? Those who had the divine right to rule over them. And we know about what happened later with the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, but before that, there was the Renaissance. And there was a big change in the mindsets all across Europe during the Renaissance. But what was that change? It was that suddenly there was a feeling. It wasn't simply that the people had an obligation to serve their natural superiors. But the governments, kings, leaders, they had an obligation to serve their people. That the relationship went both ways. That the government had an obligation to make life better for the people. Populism. And they, it's with the origins of populism in the Renaissance, you started getting governments trying their hardest to advance living standards and increase things. And that's where you get Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, and you got the music of Bach and Mozart. And then you got, you know, the Catholic Church and governments promoting science. And that's where we get Copernicus. And Copernicus, he wrote his groundbreaking book, a book that changed world history like no other. He wrote it, and it was a book that had nothing to do with politics. It was a book about astronomy. But it was called The Revolutions of Heavenly Spheres. And if you look at that book that Copernicus wrote, what did it say? He said that based on what he had discovered with his very primitive telescope he had built himself, the Earth was not the center of the universe. In fact, the solar system revolved around the sun. In fact, the planet Earth was revolving, right? And there was a revolution that happened every year. We go around the sun. And that what the Pope and the Catholic Church said, what the whole feudal order said was wrong. And what he had proved with mathematical calculations and science was correct. And it was those who followed Copernicus. They began to call themselves revolutionaries. And revolution is, you know, it's, it's from Latin, revolutio. It means to turn around. It just means to turn around. But it was those who said that, yes, scientific progress shouldn't be held back by feudal institutions. People have the ability to challenge incorrect ideas. We should have reason and debate and political discourse. That became the basis of what revolutionaries were. And it was revolutionaries who swept Europe and brought down feudalism, you know? Uh, revolutionaries who brought us the concept of the rights of man, life, liberty, property, liberty, egalite, fraternity. That all came about because these revolutionaries began toppling the old social institutions and trying to push for something that was more progressive and more scientific and gave a better life to people. And Marxism, as a political movement, emerged in the aftermath of all of that. Among those who looked at these new societies created by the overthrow of feudalism and basically said that they were disappointed, right? Serfdom was replaced by wage slavery, right? The kings and the nobles were replaced by factory owners and bankers. Greed and selfishness, which had been restricted under the old social order, became the basis of the whole economy. And if something was wrong, you know, that the, the revolutions in which society had been mobilized to overthrow the kings and fight for human rights and liberty and freedom, it had left a lot of people behind. It hadn't delivered on, on the glory that it had promised. Marxism, and Karl Marx taught us, first of all, there are two classes. There is the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. 
There are those who own the major centers of economic power, the factories, the banks, the means of transport, the means of communication, and make profits from them. And then there are the rest of us who sell our labor power to those capitalists in order to survive. We get wages. We live by working. We're proletarians. They live by owning. They're capitalists. Marxism also taught us that because society is organized in order to make a profit for a few people, and because the economy functions so that these owners of means of production can enrich themselves, that because of that, it's deeply irrational. And it continues to have sporadic crises. Right? Marxism talks about the problem of overproduction, where the capitalist is constantly looking to drive wages down as low as possible and produce as much stuff as possible at the same time. And what's the result? Eventually, people can't buy back the product that they're producing. And so you have a crash, a glut. Marxism talked about the need for the dictatorship of the proletariat, the idea that the working class should rise up and seize control of these means of production and operate them rationally so that the standard of living of the people continued to rise. You didn't have these cyclical crises of overproduction so that people weren't being exploited, so people were being taken care of, and the economy functioned in a rational way for the good of society. That's Marxism. Marxism argued that you know, this dictatorship of the proletariat, this first stage of communism, would eventually give way to an even higher stage, you know, the highest stage of communism, that eventually, with the economy under the control of the people, without the irrational profit motive, eventually the standard of living would increase so high that any need for any kind of coercion or government would fade away. And people could just kind of live a comfortable life and take what they need and do what they feel like doing, from each according to his own ability, from each according to his needs. And that was, that was the Marxist vision. And it was quite popular all throughout Europe. Uh, you had the, the formation of, you know, first the first international with Marx, which eventually collapsed as Marx was fighting with the anarchists. Then you had the rise of the second international. You had the German Social Democratic Party that was formed. You had all kinds of political parties all throughout Europe. It was one of the biggest mass movements people had ever seen. These ideas, this idea that the working class should control the means of production spread throughout Europe everywhere. But then you started to have, towards the beginning of the 20th century, what they called the crisis of Marxism. And the crisis of Marxism basically flowed from the fact that Marxist ideas were everywhere, trade unions were everywhere, democratic reforms were everywhere, a number of countries had universal male suffrage, which back then was considered to be a good thing. The fact that every man could vote, you know, the idea of giving women the right to vote, was ex that was even far more extreme than they were even thinking. But a number of European countries had universal male suffrage. Socialist ideas were everywhere. Marxism was everywhere, but the revolution wasn't coming. So you had the crisis of Marxism. And there was a reason for that, which was Marx had predicted that the gap between the proletarians and the bourgeoisie would just continue to expand. And there would be greater poverty among the workers, greater wealth among the capitalists in Europe. And eventually, the workers of Europe would just rise up and seize control of those factories, and that's how it would happen. Marx didn't foresee the development of imperialism. Right? That the capitalists in the Western countries had the ability to start expanding their power all across the globe. And instead of just exploiting the workers in Germany and France and Britain and the United States, they started exploiting the workers in Africa and in Asia and South America, the Middle East and other parts of the world. And that what they were basically doing is they were going into these developing countries and they were holding back development. When the British went to India, India had a vast textile industry. They were you know, making all kinds of cloth very effectively, all kinds of looms. When the British went to India, what did they do? Now, did they, they go to India and say, all right, start making cloth for us. We're your colonizer. No, they did the opposite. They burned their looms down. And they forced them to import their cloth from Britain. We know about the opium wars, when China tried to protect its own domestic industries, and tried to say that the importing of narcotics was not, not going to happen. So the British waged not one but two opium wars to force them to open and let the British businesses come out there and put them out of business. That's imperialism. And imperialism was not only a catastrophe in the developing world, but it also prevented any kind of revolutionary uprising from taking place in the homeland. Why? Because as, as the capitalists of the Western countries started making super profits and getting rich at the expense of people all over the world, they started to have more money, a lot more money. 
And they started to buy off sections of the working class at home. And so a lot of these working class people started to see their standard of living go up. And the working class got divided. And you had a development, especially among what they called skilled workers, trades, craftsmen. Uh, they basically got to the point that they were what you could call the aristocracy of labor, where they were workers, they were selling their labor power, but because their standard of living was going up, along with the capitalists colonizing the rest of the world, because their standard of living was increasing, they felt like imperialism and war was not so bad. And they sympathized more with their bosses than they did with people around the world who were struggling for the independence of their country. And so the working class in the Western countries became stratified because of imperialism. And so you didn't have, you didn't have, even though Marxist parties and Marxist ideas were everywhere in Europe, you didn't have the revolutions. It, it wasn't, Marx's vision was, didn't seem to be coming true. It was the crisis of Marxism. And the culmination of that crisis was in the lead up to World War I, all the socialist parties of the world pledged they would never support any capitalist war, right? The French, the Germans, the British, they all gathered. They said, we will never support a war of workers killing workers. It'll be solidarity. If they, have, if they want a war, we'll turn the guns around. We'll... And then, when World War I broke out, the German Social Democrats voted to send Germans to go kill French workers. The French Social Democrats and Marxists voted to send French people to go kill Germans. The British Social Democrats the American Social Democrats, a lot of them, you had some heroes like Eugene Debs and Rosa Luxemburg who, who stood firm and opposed the war. But for the most part, the socialist movement had become so tied in with imperialism that it refused, refused to stop a brutal war. And thousands upon thousands and millions of people died in the First World War. And that was the crisis of Marxism. And Lenin had the understanding that because of imperialism and then because of the stratification of the working class, and because of the aristocracy of labor, that the revolutionary energy at that time was not going to be in the Western countries, as Marx, as Marx had predicted. The revolution was going to come from the developing world. It wasn't going to come from the West. It was going to come from the East. And you had the Bolsheviks and Lenin, right? Lenin, you had the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. It was just your standard Marxist party, basically. It was a typical Marxist party. You agree with these principles. You can join. You pay your dues, whatever. Lenin gets his folks together and he says, we need a party of a new type, a party of people who give the whole of their lives, the whole of their lives, a party that practices democratic centralism, uh, and he develops this whole new kind of a party, which basically fits with Russia's history and Russia's traditions. Russia has a long history of revolutionary conspiracies, like the Decembrists, for example, that tried to bring down Tsar Nicholas I, or the, uh, famously there was the, the old believers, uh, of orthodox believers that refused to accept the reforms, of secret societies and such. And that was more fitting to Russia's conditions. When you have an overwhelming majority of the population that's illiterate, you know, some kind of revolutionary conspiracy among the, the educated people who are embracing revolutionary ideology, it, it made sense. And you had the Bolsheviks seizing power in Russia, creating the Soviet Union. And I will talk, and you know, I, I, I hate to, to hammer this point home, but I just can't not say this. It is my biggest pet peeve when I turn on the TV and people tell you that socialism failed, right? And I've heard this my whole life. And, and, and whenever you go, you know, it's like, oh, I believe in socialism. Well, that failed. Everyone knows that didn't work. If you look at what the so Soviet Union was able to achieve during the 1930s, you know, you can talk human rights criticisms, you can talk about things that they did wrong, but it was not an economic failure by any stretch of the imagination. This was a country that had been an agrarian economy, the overwhelming majority of the population was illiterate. Pretty soon, in the mid-1930s, during the five-year plans, they had the biggest hydroelectrical power plant in the entire world, right? They, they were producing more steel than any other country in the world. Uh, they eventually defeated the Nazis. Um, they, they wiped out illiteracy in the country. Uh, full employment. And eventually, they were the first country in outer space. On the internet, there's this meme. People will say, well, you know, he's, he believes in, in socialism, but why does he have a cell phone? That's created by capitalism. Well, actually, it's not. The first, the first cell phone was created in the Soviet Union. Uh, the LED lights that are now used on smartphones were invented in the Soviet Union, right? Um, uh, you know, AK-47 rifles, the most efficient firearm in the history of the world. You can run over it with a tank, and it still works was invented in the Soviet Union. This idea that if you get rid of capitalism, no one ever has any creativity, and everyone's just lazy and sits around, and that, that's just complete nonsense. It was with socialism that we saw Russia become a fully modern industrial country. 
If you look at what China has done, the reason that China is now the second largest economy in the world is also because of socialism, right? I mean, it was, it was socialism that created the steel mills that now make half of the steel in the entire world. You know, Cuba, a tiny island in the Caribbean, it's known all over the world. No matter where you go in the world, people know about Fidel Castro. People know about the medical volunteers and the literacy volunteers that Cuba has created. You know, this idea that socialism was a big failure, I mean, it's like, I don't understand how people can say this. It's like the big lie, right? If you just repeat a big lie, a lie that's not even close to the truth, if you just repeat it over and over again, people will believe it. And normally, normally, if I were to be giving a talk one or two years ago, I would end right here. And I would say, see, socialism worked. Look, you know, there's a party of a new type, and Lenin, and I would just end my talk right there, and I'd say, and then, yay, socialism, let's all be socialists, let's all you know, join a socialist group, and I would end my presentation right there. But I can't do that. Because if I did that, I wouldn't be doing what I came here to do. I wouldn't be doing my duty. Because a lot's happened since 1950. A lot's happened since the end of the Second World War. And we have to have a conversation about that. Has anyone ever heard the term inside baseball, right? Nobody likes inside baseball, right? I mean, I, I, I had a, a grandfather who was a big baseball fan like to watch baseball, listen to baseball on the radio. And if you got him in the same room as a, uh, another baseball fan, they could start talking about statistics and data, and pretty soon you'd have no idea what they, the two of them were talking about. You know, it was just, it was this inside thing, this little subculture. And I, I know that a lot of people that are not part of the socialist movement, when, when you sit two Marxists in the room and they're sitting there talking about all well, the Trotskyites and the Fourth International and Mao and the, the dialectical material, and they're looking at you and they're like, what are they talking about? You know, and they just want to look the other way because I don't even understand this. And there's so many different parties, right? I mean, it's like you got the, what is it, the CP and the SWP and the ISO and the QWH and the XYZ and the Fourth, there are about five Fourth Internationals, I believe. Right? There, there's a 5th International, maybe we'll even have a 12th or a 9th or a 27th International. I mean, there's a lot of confusion. So I don't want to get into too much of that. But we do need to have a conversation about what's going on. Because if, if at the time the crisis of Marxism had taken place in the lead up to the First World War, no one had come forward and talked about what was going on, there wouldn't have been a Russian Revolution. And right now, I would say we're in another crisis. There's a lot of things that don't make sense. <laughs> We have to talk about what's been going on, and we have to talk about what to do about it. So the first thing that you have to remember is that there are really two types of people who become socialists, right? No matter where you go in the world, you're going to find two types of people who become socialists. In this first milieu of people who become socialists, leftists, revolutionaries, anarchists, communists, whatever you want to call them, no matter where you go in the world, you're going to find them. And those are young people usually, some people do it their whole life, but young people especially, they tend to be from the middle class, and they tend to see injustice in the world and be angry about it. It upsets them. And they wanna, they wanna tear things down. And they, they, they see injustice and it angers them. And they're angry at the society they live in. And they see things that are just not right, and they, they wanna rebel and they wanna fight back. And, and that exists no matter where you go. You know, first world, developing world, capitalist country, socialist country, you have young people that don't like the social order, that want to change things, that want to engage with these ideas, and you can call them the revolutionary intelligentsia. And no matter what the conditions are like, the economy can be bad, the economy can be good, no matter where you go, a certain percentage of the population is going to believe that, is going to be this young revolutionary intelligentsia. They always exist. They don't make revolutions. The revolutions tend to be made by another group of people, which is the broad masses of people. And the broad masses of people become socialist when things are bad. When the economy is good, when their life is very stable, they're not interested in socialism. But when things get bad, they are open to any idea that will make their life better. And what they want out of socialism is very different than what the revolutionary intelligentsia wants out of socialism. The revolutionary intelligentsia is looking to socialism because the world is not fair, they want to tear things down, they want, they want chaos, they want rage, they're mad at the system. These folks are turning to socialism because the system is making their life unlivable. You know, they're, they're not having money to pay their kids. There's chaos, there's war, and they're looking to socialism to bring order, not to bring chaos. Completely different motivation. So you have these two types of people. And when there's a revolutionary crisis, you have the broad masses of people turning to socialism because they want to bring order. And throughout all history, no matter where you go, you have that revolutionary intelligentsia that are looking to socialism because they, they want a better world and they're angry and, and whatnot. 
And those two milieus, you know, the Russian Revolution was a great example of those two milieus coming together. The Bolsheviks were the children of the wealthy, of the nobility, of the capitalists of Russia. That's who they were. Lenin had the brilliance of kind of organizing them in a way that they could then organize the masses of people in a crisis. But after the Russian Revolution, there was some pretty big divides. And I think Stalin and Trotsky really represent a division of those two particular wings. So what was the debate? Stalin said he was for socialism in one country. He said to the people of the Soviet Union, look, there's not going to be a revolution all over the world in Germany and other places, but you know, what we're going to do, we're going to sign treaties, establish diplomatic relations with the West, but we're going to start developing the Soviet Union. We're going to bring in foreign capitalists and foreign corporations to help us do it, like the Koch brothers, for example. A lot of people don't know that, but the Koch brothers' father, Fred Koch, was brought to the Soviet Union to work with Stalin in developing their oil industry. Uh, there was Armand Hammer, who was a very wealthy Wall Street guy who did business with the Soviet Union. We're going we're gonna to work with the Western countries. We're going to have socialism in one country. We're going to make your life better. That was Stalin's vision. Trotsky, on the other hand, he advocated permanent revolution. He said, we're going to make the Soviet Union just a temporary holdout in the global revolution that's going to unfold. And that might sound great if you're a young person who's mad at the system and wants to behead every last king and tear things down. Permanent revolution. It sounds really exciting, right? But if you're the Russian people that had just been through the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War and had millions of deaths and were facing a barricade by the West where they couldn't get medicine and they couldn't get food, Stalin's idea of let's sign a treaty with the West and just build socialism in one country sounds a lot more attractive than Trotsky's idea of let's have permanent global revolution, let's make all the factories into military bases, let, let, you know, and there, there is a division. Stalin was from a, a rural peasant family. Trotsky was from a middle class, intellectual background. And the two of them really represented these two views within socialism. And after the Second World War, what I just articulated, those two wings of the socialist movement, what I just articulated became very clear to the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States. Right, there was a conference in New York City at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, I believe it was in 1949. It was an amazing conference. It was a peace conference, the Waldorf Peace Conference, and Albert Einstein was there, and uh, you know all kinds of Hollywood actors were there, and Aaron Copeland, the musician, was there, and Lillian Hellman, the writer, was there, and all of them were saying that the Soviet Union was right and the United States was wrong, and it drove. This was the height of McCarthyism in the United States, and it drove the CIA and the FBI and all the American agencies, intelligence agencies, deep state, it drove them crazy. They said, how can all these smart people be defending the Soviet Union? How can this be happening? It drove them up the wall. They said, we've got to do something about this. And so the CIA launched what they call the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And you can Google that term, right? That's on CIA.gov. And they consider it to be one of their greatest achievements, which was to try and manipulate this intellectual milieu and pull them away from the Soviet Union. And they hired Sidney Hook, who was a New York City Trotskyite professor, and they hired him to run the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And the CIA started funneling money to all kinds of artists and intellectuals and thinkers and funneling the money. And they could talk about socialism. They had no problem with them talking about socialism. They had no problem with them criticizing Western society. But they had to be anti-communist. They had to be anti-Soviet while they did it. The CIA funded a magazine called Partisan Review, right? The Congress for Cultural Freedom. It was a Trotskyite magazine. And it was very anti-capitalist, critical of capitalism, crit critical of the Western system, but always anti-Soviet as well, right? Uh, the CIA funded art galleries by Jackson Pollock, right? Jackson Pollock is famous for you know, throwing paint on the canvas, right? And they said, look at this. You know, in the socialist countries, they just have socialist propaganda everywhere, but look, how the West is beautiful. They've got Jackson Pollock who's just throwing art on the canvas. Isn't that beautiful? And the CIA made it, made it their project to try and divide these two, these two camps of people who become socialists. Take that revolutionary intelligentsia and get them to be further and further away from the socialist countries and further and further away from the working class who might become attracted to socialism in the time of a crisis. And it wasn't just art galleries and it wasn't just Trotskyite magazines. The CIA had another program that they call MK Ultra. Folks familiar with MK Ultra? And this was the distribution of narcotics and drugs. The CIA went out of its way to begin distributing drugs and narcotics all across college campuses. 
I know Harvard is near here. Harvard University, I believe, is, is somewhere near here, right? It's a couple blocks. Or... There was a professor there by the name of Timothy Leary. And in the 1960s, Dr. Timothy Leary, <coughs> with lots of funding, started going around the United States encouraging young people who were protesting the Vietnam War and protesting for civil rights to use LSD and to use drugs. And he had this slogan, tune in, turn on, drop out. And millions of dollars was poured into this project of getting people in the United States who might become socialists and communists, who were critical of the system, to start using drugs. And the socialist movement, historically, has been one of the most anti-drug things in history. I mean, when the first thing after the Chinese Revolution, they executed the heroin importers. That, that there was always a feeling that, that drug addiction and narcotics addiction was something that the socialist movement was trying to cure society of. Right? It was an ill of capitalism, where people are turned into addicts that are ruthlessly exploited and worked to death and giving every last cent they have, and, and that drug addiction is something that the revolutionary movement was trying to cure. But, lo and behold, starting in, in the 1960s, suddenly if you went into socialist and left circles, we all had to get high, man, it was the thing to do. And another thing that, that happened during this time was the rise of the Eastern cults. You know, it's very interesting. You know, the Hare Krishna movement, for example, in India, if you go to India, you talk to communists in India, which I have, they are considered in India to be one of the most right-wing movements that they are. They're Hindu nationalists. They want to restore very traditional, conservative things in India. However, in the United States, if you go to left-wing marches and peace rallies, there's the Hare Krishna movement. And look at them. They're Eastern men. They're, they're wearing their orange robes. And, and, it's, it, and, it, and you suddenly saw Eastern mysticism and things like that accepted in left circles. Another example is the Dalai Lama. You know, the, the feudal kingdom that existed in Tibet was, was something that was deeply admired by Nazi Germany. So much to the point that this book that is widely promoted in left liberal circles now, Seven Years in Tibet, the author of it is Heinrich Harrer. And Heinrich Harrer was a member of Hitler's SS. He was actually, that's why he was in Tibet and had the opportunity to so closely observe feudal Tibet. And that Julius Ebola, another thinker who was associated with Italian fascism, was just blown away by how, how you know, authoritarian and strict Tibetan society was. And he was saying to, to the Europeans, this is what we need, we need to recreate it. In fact, the reason, one of the reasons the Nazis adopted the swastika as their symbol was because the Nazis really admired the caste system of India. As they said, look, there's no strikes and protests or anything, everyone's just born into their caste, it's perfect. This is, you know, this is the ancient, traditional way. It was always understood in Europe prior to the Second World War the mainstream viewpoint was Christianity. That was the mainstream viewpoint. Most people were Christians. The left promoted science and dialectical materialism, and it was the extreme right and the fascists that tended to promote Eastern mysticism and the occult and, and that kind of thing. But after the Second World War, all of a sudden in left-wing circles, Eastern mysticism and the occult, along with the drugs, along with the anti-Soviet stuff, suddenly flows into left circles. And you have a lot of foundations that are funding this kind of thing. And this didn't just have an impact in the United States. Now, I often get eye rolls when I mention the name George Soros. People think, oh God, he's Tucker Carlson here, you know, Bill O'Reilly here, Glenn Beck, it's all George Soros. Well, who is George Soros? Well, George Soros is a Hungarian billionaire who basically started funneling money in the 80s, 70s to dissident movements within the Eastern Bloc people in Hungary and Czechoslovakia and Romania and the Soviet Union who were upset with the socialist system that existed. And their grievances were very real, okay? That, that there were a lot of people that were you know, college professors, engineers, scientists who felt stifled by the socialist system. They felt like they didn't have the ability to put their ideas into practice. They felt like they weren't free to, to make the kind of movies that they wanted. They had some legit grievances. If I was in their shoes, I'm sure I would have been mad about it also. The overwhelming majority of the population did not share their grievances, the, you know, but this, this intellectual strata within the Eastern Bloc had some, you know, some legit concerns. And George Soros figured out how to funnel money into the Eastern Bloc in order to manipulate those grievances. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, that's another name, that again, you get eye rolls. That's, you watch Morning Joe? Mika Brzezinski, that's her father. So, you know, it, it, this is not a, not a, not a non-influential person, right? Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski also started figuring out how to manipulate these folks and staging uprisings. And if you look at these uprisings, 
that happened across Eastern Europe in the 1960s, 70s, up until the, the crisis and the fall of the Soviet Union in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. If you look at it, a lot of these people didn't even know what they were protesting. A lot of them said that they liked socialism. They're like, I like socialism. I just want to be able to shop at Walmart. I just want to be able to make whatever kind of movie. I want to keep my guaranteed job. I want to keep my guaranteed health care. I want to keep all the benefits of the socialist system. But I also, I, I have my grievance and I'm going to pour into the streets. They didn't even realize they were being manipulated. And that's why when you go to any formerly socialist country throughout Eastern Europe, every poll overwhelmingly shows people say life was so much better before the fall of the Soviet Union, before the fall of the Eastern Bloc, whether it's Romania, Czechoslovakia. People say we didn't know what we had. In all of these countries, the overwhelming majority of the population voted in polls and referendums to keep the socialist system. But there were people within the governments who had been compromised. There was this intellectual strata, this milieu that was protesting and had their legitimate grievances. And the West and the CIA and British intelligence and others were able to manipulate that discontent and that crisis to bring down socialism across Eastern Europe. You know, there's all this talk, oh, it's under socialism, everyone's starved. Look at what happened in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union after the fall of socialism, when capitalism was imposed on those countries. It was an epic disaster. People lost their life savings, right? People who had never had to worry about being unemployed in their entire lives were suddenly starving, right? Uh, and a one poll, uh, one statistic shows that the population of Russia actually decreased by roughly 10% during the 1990s. Now, it wasn't just people dying, it was also people just fleeing because there was nothing there economically. There had been, you know, maybe, maybe some level of, of drug addiction prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. The heroin epidemic in, in Russia and in Eastern Europe was massive in the 1990s. The suicide rate was massive. Um, sex trafficking, right? I mean, Eastern Europe became the sex trafficking capital of the world. All these women that had had guaranteed jobs and guaranteed maternity leave before were suddenly being sold into sexual slavery all over the world. The, the overthrow of socialism in Eastern Europe and neoliberal economics, it was one of the biggest humanitarian disasters we've ever seen. People were dying and starving and suffering. And it was that disaster that, that kind of paved the way for the situation that we're now in in the world. And the thing is, you'll notice all these socialist countries throughout the late 80s, early 90s were falling. You know, they were, they were collapsing. You know, China did not fall. The Chinese Communist Party is actually stronger today than it was during the 1980s, I would say, than it was. And if you look at what happened in China before the death of Mao, shortly before it, you had the death of Zhou Enlai, who had been on the long march with Mao, was a key figure, was, was aligned with Mao, was associated with Mao. And after Zhou Enlai's death, there was what you call, what they refer to as the Tiananmen Incident of 1976, where people who had attended the funeral of Zhou Enlai went out and rioted and burned cars and burned buildings and chanted anti-communist slogans. It was basically an anti-communist riot that went on for a couple days in the aftermath of the death of Zhou Enlai. And that, you know, in the final years of Mao's life, the Gang of Four um, had been in power. That was Mao's wife and, and three other people. And Many people pointed out the view of the Gang of Four was that it didn't matter if China was not increasing its level of standard of living. That was fine as long as it was egalitarian, as long as it was fair, right? It doesn't matter, doesn't matter if the standard of living is increasing, doesn't matter if life is getting better, just so long as everyone, you know, as, as we're doing it in a revolutionary socialist way, right? That was, that was the philosophy of the Gang of Four. They tell the story of there was a group of students uh, who went to the United States and, uh, and saw that the people in the United States had color television. And they had come back and pitched, you know, pitched to the government, why don't we start manufacturing color televisions in the United States? And how Mao's wife got on television and screamed that these students were ugly counter-revolutionaries and how disgusting that they would suggest that China would make color televisions. We don't want color televisions. That's Western decadence. Right? They tell stories about every time it seemed like the economy was going to get moving, the Gang of Four would stage another down-with campaign. And everyone would have to walk, walk off the factory and they'd have to protest. How they went to the North Korean border and burned effigies of Kim Il-sung for being a, quote, fat revisionist pig because he was neutral between the Soviet Union and China. And that life, you know, became so unlivable during that period that a lot, of, especially the intellectuals and the professors and the engineers and the scientists just felt so stifled by the socialist system. And those were the people in Eastern Europe. It was that strata of people that ended up overthrowing socialism in the Eastern Bloc. But in China, you had the rise of Deng Xiaoping. And Deng Xiaoping did the opposite. What did he do? He let all those people start their own businesses. He said, okay, we're gonna keep 
you know, banking under control of the state. We're going to keep industries under the control of the state. But all you folks, you know, you can go study in the United States. You can go study agriculture in the United States. You, yeah, and there was an opening up. The reform and the opening up basically neutralized that strata that was used to overthrow socialism in the Eastern Bloc. And in fact, now in China, a lot of the people from that milieu tend to be the most enthusiastic supporters of the Communist Party. Because the Communist Party is the one that enabled them to open a business, enabled them to put their ideas into practice. At this point, China has lifted 700 million people out of poverty, and they've got Huawei Technologies, the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the entire world. The standard of living has just drastically, drastically increased overall. It's the second largest economy in the world. Vietnam had a very similar economic miracle. And the World Business Forum uh, in, in Davos published a report referring to Vietnam's economic miracle. And they try to blame it all on liberalization. It's very funny. If liberalization and privatization was the answer, I think Bangladesh would be a paradise, right? Or you know, you know, maybe Guatemala, right? I and mean, all these countries that just let Wall Street do corporations do whatever they want, they would all be having a boom. But they admit the fact that the Vietnamese government not only has it allowed foreign investment, but in addition to that, it's funded heavily the education of the population, it's built infrastructure, it's done all kinds of things to facilitate foreign capital allowing the domestic economy to grow. It's been controlled foreign investment. At this point, you've got North Korea and Cuba, both of which very much want to do what China and Vietnam has done. And that seems to be underlying, by the way, the disagreement about the North Korean negotiation. That's basically what's going on, is that uh, that, that there's a section of American capital, people like Jim Rogers, that want to get rich by investing in North Korea. They think it's a great opportunity. They think of all the American corporations that got rich investing in China in the 80s. They want to have, have that in North Korea. And then there's another section of the American intelligence community and strategic community that says, oh no, if we, if we allow North Korea to do what China did, to do what Vietnam did, and the standard of living in North Korea vastly increases, if that happens, uh, the result will be that the Korean Workers' Party, which is a very revolutionary, Marxist, and anti-imperialist party, that will result in them being even stronger than they've ever been, and they don't want to do it. And that's the divide. That's really the divide. It's George Soros and his wing of American capital, uh, they, they want North Korea to remain under siege and isolated. And Jim Rogers, the legendary investor who lives in Singapore, he wants to invest lots of money in North Korea and make money. And that's the division, basically. That's a division that's going on. And you see Trump, I think Trump very much wants to make a lot of money off of North Korea joining the world economy. And, and on the other hand, you've got you know, wings of the intelligence agencies and such, and figures within both the Democratic Party and the neocon wing of the Republican Party that desperately want to keep that from happening. Cuba has already started to move in, in the Chinese direction. And also the Bolivarian countries, you know, Nicaragua. Before the last election in Nicaragua in 2016, the Wall Street Journal ran an article and praised the huge economic successes of the Sandinista government there. I mean, vastly increasing the GDP, vastly raising uh, living standards in the country. And it's been pointed out that one of the ways the government in Nicaragua has done that is they've enabled people in Nicaragua to be what they call micro-entrepreneurs. They get a loan from the government, they coordinate with the government's central economic plan, and they open their own business, and, and they, they live a good life. And I've seen this. You know, in, in Venezuela, oil is in the hands of the state, right? You have a lot of worker cooperatives and collectivos. But at the end of the day, people that want to you know, start their own business and all that are actually empowered to do so by the socialist system. So instead of having these folks feel stifled and trapped in a government-run steel industry and, or, or in a job where they can't really do what they want, it's the opposite. The government unleashed them. The government gave them the creativity and the power to go out and do things. Um, but at the same time that they do this, they develop a core of people who are loyal to the revolution. And, and you know, one of the most beautiful moments that I saw when I was in Venezuela, in 2015 I was in Venezuela, and they took me to one of the colectivos, the Beehive Commune. I was there and I met uh, a woman who was 18 years old at the time. She told us her life story. She was there and she was wearing like army, army fatigue pants, and she was one of the security coordinators at the, at the Beehive Commune in central Caracas. She was telling us about how, when she was a child, you know, she didn't even speak Spanish. She, was, you know, she spoke only her indigenous language. Her family had gotten kicked out of their land, and she <coughs> and her family were basically homeless, and, and they'd come to Caracas to try and survive. She didn't speak Spanish, and, and she and her mother were homeless, and this socialist group had found her and you know, provided her family with some of the resources to survive. She'd gotten involved in being an activist for the Chavez movement. And there in this commune in, in central Caracas, 
it, it, very close to, they had actually a painting of The Last Supper, the, the famous painting of Leonardo da Vinci or whatever. But instead of having like the, the disciples, they had like Stalin and Mao and, and, and Chavez, you know, you know. And, and I'm in this place with big pictures of Marx and Lenin, but also big pictures of Jesus and also big pictures of Simone Bolivar. She's wearing her army pants and she says to me, she says, I believe that I was brought to this earth with a purpose, she tells me. I believe God brought me to this earth to die for Hugo Chavez and the revolution. And she said, that's what I will do. And there's a lot of people in Venezuela like her. There, there are people who have grievances and frustrations, but the core of people that are loyal to the Bolivarian Revolution, that understand Marxism and the revolutionary ideology that made it, is not small, and it's armed, you know. And as, and and you look at this. I mean, this is a country that's been under siege. I think it's kind of amazing if you think about it. Could you imagine what would happen in the United States if there were artificially created food shortages? All of a sudden, we couldn't, you know, if all of a sudden we couldn't get food at the stores because people who weren't trying to overthrow the government were stealing food and barricading at places, and all of a sudden we couldn't get food. Could you imagine what would happen here if all in all the major cities people were beheading cops on motorcycles and and bombing buildings and and, and then on top of that the electric power went off? I mean, we would be in a crisis in the United States if that happened. It would be the utter chaos in the streets. Well, the Venezuelan government, is, I mean, they're, they're at this point under such a state of siege. You know, they're facing such an onslaught. They ain't going anywhere. I mean, they're, they're not afraid of it. In fact, this Juan Guaido individual, this individual that Trump has crowned the president of Venezuela, he's walking around telling people to rise up, and they don't even feel the need to arrest the guy. It's like, go ahead, you know, yeah, do your thing, whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, the Venezuelan government isn't even threatened by this. They have won the loyalty of such a solid core of the population that they're not even, they're, they're, they're not really in danger of being overthrown. And Marco Rubio and all of them, they're doing everything, they're throwing everything at the country. They're staging, I remember the New York Times even admitted that they, they when they were, they were the food caravans that were coming over the border, uh, were, were lit on fire, not by Maduro, but by the opposition. They ran up to it and lit their own caravan on fire, hoping to provoke it. When you see uh, Trump was speaking to the Venezuelan exile community in, uh, in Miami, and when he was speaking to them, I remember, uh, you know, he's speaking to this crowd of people that are, most of them are like whiter than I am, you know, and he's telling them, oh, you know, uh, you know, you know, Maduro is this evil dictator, and one of them shouts, send the troops, send the troops. Why does he want the troops sent? Because the people of Venezuela aren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that Venezuelan military is trained in Cuba. They understand Marxism through and through. I, this, this, this is a government that is solidly intact. But that brings me to another point, which is that, you know, when I talked to that young woman, it has to be admitted that on some level, on some level Marx did underestimate the spiritual aspect of human beings, right? And so what that woman was saying wasn't motivated by her direct economic interest, right? She wasn't saying, I'm going to die for Chavez because that'll get me two more cents an hour and I'll you know, be less exploited by my boss. She was saying it because she felt a spiritual connection with the revolution, what's going on there. And within human beings, I would say there is a deep desire to become heroic, right? And I think that you know, here in the United States, we face a problem of over-socialization, right? Now, if you listen to Fox News and conservatives, you know, they have this rant they love to do. It's very cliche. And they rant about kids these days. Like, oh, these kids these days, they're so weak. They're pathetic little snowflakes. Every kid gets a trophy now. When I was growing up, my parents beat the shit out of me. You know, it's this, this, this rant. But they're kind of missing something in their, in, their, in their tirade against young people. What they're missing is that, that B.F. Skinner, who is uh, the behaviorist, right? He's the, the, the one who studied human behavior. He documented that it's much more effective to control people with reward than it is with punishment. If you punish somebody, they tend to resent it. They'd be like, oh, you're treating me badly. And even if the person is completely guilty of it, they'll do huge leaps in their mind to convince themselves they're just being unfairly victimized. But if you reward somebody, very few people are gonna be like, I don't deserve this reward. You're trying to manipulate me. You're trying to control my behavior. No, people are like, I, I just got a reward. I'm, you're exactly right. What you're saying about me is correct. And then rewarding people is much more effective in manipulating people. And social media has done a number on the brains of, of Americans. Because nowadays, we are all checking to see if we get that social reward every two seconds, right? We're looking at our phones. We, you know, we post, I just went to the store. It's like, how many people push like? How many people push like? Oh, only two people liked it. I've got five, 500 friends. What's going on? Only two people liked that I went to the store. 
And we're constantly trying to get that validation, that reward from other people. And it's made us weaker than we've ever been. And if you look at the great heroes throughout history, they tend to be nonconformists. Think about Joan of Arc, right? Joan of Arc was a, was a woman who put on men's clothes, organized her French people to fight against the British, and was burned at the stake for doing it. And she's a saint. And she's honored. Why? Because she was nonconforming. She wasn't afraid of what other people thought. You know, if you want to talk about heroism, this picture is something I often think about. Now, are people familiar with this picture? Yes. Now, I mean, this woman's not trying to be popular in doing what she's doing. This ability to say, look, I have the right to go to a school, whether I'm white or black, and facing just a mob of people screaming at her. Uh, according to what was written at the time, apparently this woman here who's screaming at her is screaming the phrase, lynch her, lynch her, right? But she has the ability to be surrounded by all these people that are hating her, not approving of her behavior, telling her she's absolutely wrong, that she deserves to be killed. She keeps her head down, and she just walks into the school, right? That's being heroic, right? That's part of what I think many people wish they had, that ability to go against the grain, to be heroic, to do things that are not going to get them rewarded and praised. The fact that so many young people, you know, they pour into these superhero movies nowadays, right? They, they, every week they seem to come out with another one. Batman, Superman, and, uh, you know, and there's a million Spider-Mans, you know. Why do people pour into these movies? It's about somebody being heroic. Right? Somebody who doesn't go along with what society wants. Someone who's so non-conforming. They go out of their way to do something brave and bold. right? To, to, to take great risks, to help those in need for a greater cause. This is something all of us long to be. We all long to be heroic. And I think especially those of us who become socialists in this time. A lot of us really, really long to be heroic. And what breaks my heart is that a lot of socialist groups, unfortunately, don't allow the younger people who join to become heroic. I mean, one of the, the worst examples I've ever seen is at one point I was in Chicago. I was, you know, promoting some socialist event, but I went to a meeting of this very small Trotskyite organization. It was like a reading group that they were having. And there was, you know, I, I, at the time I was living in Cleveland, and they're like, oh, you're new, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Cleveland. And this young woman who was there was part of this Trotskyite socialist group. She had like a, like a, an, uh, like the, what is it, the women empowerment symbol, like tattooed on her forearm, I believe. And she was like, oh, my band, you know, they played a show in Cleveland a couple weeks ago. And I said to her, oh, I said, are, are you in a band? You know, that's cool. And then the leader, the old, you know, at least 60, 70 year old leader of the socialist group, this older man got this frown on, her fit, on his face. And he looked at her and he said, didn't we talk about this? And she's like, oh, I, I mean, I used to be in a band. I'm sorry. That's nuts. Okay. And that, that seems to be a lot of the problem with the socialist movement is in, in the United States is that young people join socialist groups because they want to go out and achieve things. They want to go out and do something. And they join these groups, and these groups do the opposite. They hold them back, right? These groups tell you, no, you can't, right? And in a lot of cases, you look at a lot of these socialist groups, unfortunately, they exist to kind of glorify the egos of a small group of people who, are, when you get to know them, are rather pessimistic and don't really believe that any revolution is going to happen. It's just kind of their own little ego trip, their own little show that they put on. It's kind of sad. Um, but don't tell me, don't tell me that, uh, that millennials are lazy. Right? That's the line, the line you get. Right? Millennials are just lazy. They don't want to go out and do anything. They don't get anything done. If you get any group of young people in the United States together, you're going to find young people that are working six, seven-hour shifts, serving coffee, on their feet the whole time, with a boss standing over them saying, work harder, work <coughs> faster, get better statistics at the cash register. You're not selling enough. You don't have good enough numbers. And they're exhausted. At the end of that six or seven or eight hour shift, they finally they get to go home and relax, and just relax and enjoy their life. Oh no, that's when they get their laptop and their backpack and they go to class. And what do they do then? They run up more student debt and they get ripped off again, right? This is unbelievable. The millennial generation of the United States has been really just beaten down by this system. The, 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 the conditions that young people are facing are just unconscionable. You know, I come to the city. Last night, I actually got to visit the town where William Z. Foster was born, Taunton, Massachusetts. I think, what if William Z. Foster were here? Right? What would he? What would he tell these young people that are getting, you know, getting ripped off by their bosses? He'd organize them. He'd tell them to fight back. But a lot of people, you know, they say to me, Caleb, you know, you know, we feel like you've changed, right? There's pictures of me, 
you know, running around Union Square in New York City with, with the North Korean flag. And people are like, you know, we like the old kid. Like, look at you now. You're wearing a suit and you're traveling around the world and meeting with people. You've changed. You've changed. Uh, no, I haven't changed. I've gotten serious, okay? Because this isn't a game. This, this really isn't a game, right? And that, that a lot of what passes for leftism in the United States right now, and I say this with all due respect, is, I mean, it's, it's you know, they talk about LARPing, live action role play. Or, you know, people put on the costume of their favorite, like, you know, character from Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, and, you know, I'm done LARPing, you know? And one of the, one of the greatest examples of that is people need to stop, stop, and I urge people to just stop glorifying and calling for violent revolution, okay? That, that is the height of juvenility, right? Violent revolutions are horrific, horrific things in which lots and lots of people die, and violent revolutions take place when people have no other choice, when they're backed up against it, when they're being hurt, when they, it's a kill or be killed situation. And what they refer to as ultra-left adventurism, people going out and blowing up buildings or engaging in active terrorism, that's something that serious revolutionaries, Lenin, you know, Stalin, Mao, people like that, have always opposed that kind of activity. When people go out and they think, oh, I'm gonna be so exciting, I'm gonna do some violent activity. That is, something, that is something that every serious revolutionary has always opposed, that kind of behavior. It's not serious, it's juvenile. And if you look at the revolutions that have happened, and they were very violent, they were acts of self-defense. It was when people had no choice, when people were being, being killed, their lives were in danger, the society they're living in was crumbling, and they, they defended themselves largely by having a revolution. If you look at it, you know, the Chinese Revolution was now fighting against Japan, then fighting against Chiang Kai-shek. The, the Russian Revolution, in a lot of ways, was after the, uh, after the, you know, the overthrow of the Tsar. You, know, you had factions within the, the government there, the provisional government, that wanted to crush any anti-war force. The, you know, the Kornilov reaction, they called it, where Kornilov was going to march into St. Petersburg and declare himself the military dictator and lock up, lock up and, and kill anyone that opposed World War I. So, you know, the, the Russian Revolution was very much an act of self-defense. The Cuban Revolution was an act of self-defense. The Bolivarian Revolution was an act of self-defense, of people fighting against austerity, and getting elected peacefully, and then having to defend that elected office. Uh, the, the revolutions are always an act of self-defense. And I also want to say that, you know, I'm not afraid to say that I love my country. I love the United States of America. I don't think the United States is superior to any other country. I'm not a chauvinist. I'm not a nationalist by any means. The United States isn't even a nation. I don't know how I could be a nationalist. But the reason I believe in socialism is because I want to make life better for working class people here in the United States of America. I want their living conditions to improve. And I believe that the only way that's possible is if they join arm in arm with working class people around the world and fight for justice. And if you read, there's a beautiful letter that Lenin wrote to the American workers. And he wrote it you know, just after the Russian Revolution. And he speaks to the American working class, and he talks about, you know, you, you are people who engage in a heroic revolutionary war against the, the British Empire. You're the people that overturned slavery. You built the IWW and the Socialist Party and Eugene Debs. There's a part of you that is with us, that is with the Bolsheviks, and that, that what we're about over in Russia, there's a, there's a part of the American working class that, that's with us, right? He didn't say to the American workers, shame on you, you reactionary, you know, how dare you? Yeah. No, he said he made an appeal for solidarity. And that we do have a revolutionary tradition in this country. At the time slavery was going on in this country, there were a lot of slave revolts and uprisings. The time the Native Americans were being killed, you had a lot of Native Americans who fought back heroically. I mean, all throughout the history of this country, every time there was a brutal reactionary war, you had Americans who stood up and said, this war is wrong. Went to prison for doing so. Eugene Debs, uh, others, you know. And that if we are serious about making socialism in the United States, we need to be serious and recognize that it's not going to be foreign socialism that comes to the United States of America. We're not going to import the ideology of China, the ideology of Venezuela, the ideology of Norway or Sweden. Or we're not going to import some foreign ideology. When socialism comes to the United States, it's going to be a socialism rooted in the struggles that are happening here in the United States and in the history of the United States, and in the conditions of the United States. I love to read about Che Guevara. I love to read about uh, you know, the revolutions that happened in the 20th century in different countries. But I really love to read about William Z. Foster. I really love to read about Huey Newton and the Black Panthers. And if we're serious about socialism in the United States, we ought to be studying the history of the United States 
and figuring out how we can fit our beliefs and what we're trying to promote in with the history of the United States. You know, right now there's a big division within the American ruling class. That's very, very apparent. When times are good, the ruling class tends to function you know, almost by consensus. Ronald Reagan used to say, we're all friends after six, right? Democrats, Republicans, we get up, we run against each other in elections, we're all friends after six, it's just a job. They're not all friends after six right now. They clearly are. There are some big divisions within the American ruling class right now. And the fact that, that wages are dropping and that, that the pro rate of profit, the falling rate of profit, is increasing and that the computer revolution is creating a crisis of overproduction like we've never seen. I mean, we're, we're, they're getting ready to basically just get rid of industrial labor. I mean, anything that could be done by a human in production can be done by a machine at this point. Um, and, and at this point, the divisions among the ruling class, some of these long-standing divisions, you know, at this point, these divisions are, are escalating, I would say. There's a long-standing division, for example, uh, between the ultra-rich and the rich in the United States, right? That, you know, if you talk about the Rockefellers and the Morgans and the Carnegies and the DuPonts, these wealthy, wealthy families that have been running the United States for hundreds of years, that have entrenched wealth and power. Uh, some people like to refer to the New England establishment. I don't know if I should say that here or not now that I'm in Boston, but, but you know who I'm referring to, right? That faction that has so much power tends to be slightly liberal, right? Because they can afford it, right? Tax me more, right? And they don't mind the government being involved in the economy because they're rich enough, they're gonna get the government monopoly anyway. And if the way they see it, if they can have social peace, right? It's worth it to make sure that society stays in order. But then you got people like Betsy DeVos, you got people like the Koch brothers, right? And they actually believe all this free market rhetoric, right? That if we just privatize everything, everyone can get rich. Look, I got rich, everyone can get rich, right? That if we get rid of the minimum wage, there'll be no unemployment, right? That'll be great. Yeah, they believe all this junk, right? And that, that's a division, that the richest of the rich tend to be slightly liberal and open to more Rooseveltian style reforms. And that the lower levels of the rich, the people that maybe they only have, what, 20, 25 billion dollars, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. The lower levels of wealth in the United States tend to be more right-wing and conservative when it comes to economics. You've also got a long-standing division between the CIA and the Pentagon, right? The Pentagon, those are guys that have really learned and studied the art of blowing things up. They are very good at blowing things up, right? Whereas the CIA, those are people that have studied over the course of years how to gradually, very carefully, make the United States loved around the world and liquidate and wipe out its enemies. And the art of blowing things up and the art of making everyone love the United States and isolating and wiping out its enemies are two different, different things, right? In the Obama administration, the CIA, that was Langley in the White House, if you've ever seen it, right? Barack Obama, he got in there, he, you know, he has a, a Muslim middle name, he, you know, he has a background, he went to Egypt, he apologized, he was making friends with the world, trying to convince the world the USA isn't so scary, it isn't so awful, right? Uh, whereas the Trump administration, with their threats against the world, their demands that NATO buy more weapons from the United States, they seem to be in with the Pentagon strategy. The Pentagon, they peace through strength, that's a Trump slogan, that's the, that's the Pentagon's worldview. They don't care if the rest of the world likes the United States or not. As long, as long as they're terrified of the United States and you can make a lot of money by blowing things up, they don't care. The CIA, on the other hand, their job is to be the PR agency of the United States, right? They, they, you know, and their job is to very carefully get everyone to think that the USA is Mr. Nice Guy and that the USA is a very friendly country and don't worry about us and we just love freedom and, and, and be very friendly. And that's a division that's playing out. And then the other thing you'll notice about the Trump administration versus the Obama administration is that in some cases it just is different constituencies. The Trump administration wants to negotiate with North Korea. Uh, the Obama administration wanted to negotiate with Iran. The Trump administration wants to isolate and attack Iran. The Obama administration wanted to isolate and attack North Korea. It's just a, it's just a, a division, right? Perhaps the Trump administration is closer to the Netanyahu Likud party wing in Israel that sees Iran as the direct threat. Perhaps the, the Obama administration is closer to South Korea. I don't know exactly the details of it, but it's simply a geopolitical difference. What country do we go after? What country do we make, you know, try to be nice to? But at the end of the day, the Trump administration and the Obama administration basically have the same goal with both Iran and North Korea. You know, the goal is to overthrow this government that gets in the way of Western capitalism. The question is, how do you do it? 
do you do it by being friendly, opening up, slipping forces in there, gradually creating a constituency, sowing unrest, and tearing the government down? That's what happened with Libya. Or, or do you isolate the country, put them under sanctions, put them under siege, and eventually just invade them? And that's what was done with Iraq, for example. It's different strategies, but the goal is the same. Karl Marx, he wrote a very important pamphlet called The Eighth Brumiere of Louis Bonaparte. And it was about, you know, in France in 1851, there was a crisis of overproduction. There was mass unemployment, there was suffering, and one section of the ruling class that was grouped around, you know, the, the nephew of Napoleon seized power in a coup in order to try and bring order back to society. They called themselves the Party of Order. And they seized power. And they did a lot of really progressive things. They built railroads, they created uh, hospitals for the poor, but they also killed a lot of communists, and they also crushed a lot of revolutionary movements and organizers. And some people, they saw all these great progressive reforms that Louis Bonaparte and, and the, you know, the party of order had created, and they said, oh, this is a revolution. Other people said, oh, no, this is, this is awful. And Karl Marx's pamphlet goes into great detail documenting the divisions within the French ruling class how the industrial capitalists didn't like Louis Bonaparte, but the financial capitalists liked him, how the farmers seemed to like Louis Bonaparte, uh, how the industrial workers didn't particularly care for him. If you read it, it's an analysis of divisions within the ruling class playing out when there's a crisis. You know, it's very easy to just say, well, I'm against all the capitalists. I just want a revolution. That's, that's communist kindergarten. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's communism 101. But if you actually learn what's going on among the ruling class and the divisions that are taking place, then you can strategically operate and try to change things. I want to say that I believe that everyone in this room, and I don't know you, some of you I'm meeting for the first time tonight, and that's okay, I hope I get to know you better by the end of the evening. I want to say that I believe that everyone in this room, to some degree or other, has the ability to become a socialist hero. No matter who you are, on some level, there's a part of you that has the ability to be heroic in a socialist way. And so I hope that we can continue this conversation, we can stay in touch, and we can try to unleash a wave of socialist heroism in our time. Thank you.